great to uh, be here. Thanks, nice to meet everybody here at the Mag Lab for summer school, and uh, we'll talk about a few things. Uh, I work for Quantum Design, so it's kind of fun that I get to see all your experiments and help you decide uh, what instruments you can choose for your experiments. But I don't have to do the research, so I can just read the paper and follow up, so it's great. I don't know if you've ever read this book. Uh, we had the bitter magnets and you saw these things, but Francis Bitter wrote this book. I read this book when I was 10, and I still have it somewhere in my library. But it's an interesting book. It was written in the late 50s uh, about magnets. So pre-superconductors, talks about ferromagnetism and how magnets work and things like that. And, and uh, I recommend reading it because it sort of makes a connection when you think about uh, science, right? You do one thing, and it may not relate directly, but you'll find some piece of the puzzle where it comes back together. So Steve Hill was talking about uh, uh, the G-factor, right? So Bitter worked on the G-factor. So he worked on magnets built into that. Here it is, the G-factor. So it comes around, it takes 40 years, but you come back to magnets. So let's talk about techniques. We'll talk about a couple of things. I'll give you an overview of the PPMS uh, systems. We'll talk about uh, transport measurements, how to prepare and mount your samples, uh, the types of transport measurements you can make on the system, uh, custom experiments, then we'll move over to VSM measurements, sample mounting for the VSM, measurement tips for the VSM, and then just uh, sum it up with just uh, technical supports and applications. Uh, half the group saw the information on the VSM yesterday in the, in the uh, seminar, so uh, the other half will see that today. So there's some sample pucks that we'll pass around, and you'll see some of the sample pucks for the uh, VSM in the uh, lab practical. Uh, this is the PPMS system, so this is the Evercool version, so this is the cryogen free version of the system. We have the uh, 16 Tesla wet liquid helium system. Uh, 7, 9, 14, and 16 Tesla PPMS units. Uh, we still sell wet systems, they're probably not as many, but uh, a place like the Magnet Lab, you have a lot of helium, so uh, you can accommodate that. Number of experiments. We came out with the next generation instruments, which is the Dynacool, completely cryogen free, so you don't have the option of a liquid uh, helium system. Once again, it takes the same kind of experiment platforms and you can do a number of the experiments. So we'll just look at the transport uh, and a couple of the magnetic type measurements. Uh, the other instrument that we offer, and this is the instrument class that we started the company with, the uh, MPMS. So this is the magnetic property measurement system and we're at version three of the system. We started off with the MPMS uh, 1986 with the superconductivity craze. So if Imagine coming out with a system where uh, you hit the market just right and everybody needs one to measure their high temperature superconductors that came out. So they used this system to make a lot of the earlier measurements. We made this system cryogen free, but you might see a version in between the XL system, that's a five and a seven Tesla liquid helium based system, that we can also make those cryogen free. So we can retrofit the liquid helium systems back into cryogen free systems. Um, so this is the squid-based magnetometer system. So you can do squid measurements, you can do things, uh, magnetometry uh, measurements at high pressure. So we have a lot of dedicated experiments for this MPMS system. I won't talk as much about this system but in this talk, but there's a whole other class of experiments that you can do on the squid. You have a better sensitivity than the, the VSM. So the heart of the uh, experiments in the PPMS, the physical property system, is the experiment sample puck. So we've got some pucks on the table here that we'll pass around the room that you can share with everybody just so people can see how to mount the sample. So there's a 12-pin connector on the bottom of the puck and that plugs into the sample chamber. There's an extraction tool that you put the puck in the extraction tool, slide that into the instrument, and uh, release the extraction tool and your sample is sitting at the center of the magnetic field in the, in the system. So this is a cutout of the uh, system probe. So the probe sits inside the cryostat. So 
in the laboratory, the 16 Tesla system, the probe is going into s inside the, the helium dewer or the helium ther thermos bottle, and that's surrounded by liquid helium. In the wet system, there's some pickups to pick up the liquid helium. We've got a control system with uh, a couple of impedance flows so that we can control the impedance and flow of the helium through the sample space. So we, the magnet's cold, but then we have a separate cooling circuit that we can pick the liquid helium up to cool the sample. And we've got a high temperature flow plumbing and low temperature flow plumbing, so we can get good temperature control and stability. So the important thing that we want to provide is good temperature control and good temperature stability. Your sample's at the correct temperature, or the sample space is at the correct temperature, and then the magnetic field, right? So you can control those, and we have the electronics in the rack that control those two factors and the control system that controls the PID. So the puck sits at the center of the magnetic field. Uh, we know where that center is, so it's at the top of the platform on the transport puck. If you have a 16 Tesla system, there's a slight difference in that center, and we've put that out in an application note. So there's a 16 Tesla system here, so we know where that field center is uh, for those measurements. So essentially, this whole probe fits inside the PPMS system. The Dynacool is slightly different because things are integrated because it's cryogen free and the magnets cool via conduction. So in the systems that you're gonna see here in the lab, they're liquid helium cooled systems. Uh, there's wiring on the sample chamber. So a lot of experiments that you do here at the mag lab, you have the wiring on the probe. So the puck has the connections on the bottom we decided to run the wiring on the outside of the sample chamber down to the bottom of those connections. And uh, the twisted pair, uh, copper alloy, uh, we know the resistance of those, so you can measure the resistance of those wires. Uh, the one thing to make note of is the breakdown voltage of these wires, so you can only put 50 volts on these wires. Some people ask, can I put higher voltage in them? And you're limited to 50 volts in the, in the application. Exactly, exactly. And in fact, in the lab you have, uh, there's a probe that has a, uh, a piezo stack and that needs a high voltage to drive it. So they put the wires down the, the ultimate probe. Yes. When you said low resistance copper alloy, what, what alloy is better than copper? I'd have to look up the, I don't, I don't build the systems. Don't build those systems, but I'll make a note of that. Uh, they're heat sunk on the uh, on the outside. Yes. The uh, the sample chamber slides into the system, so if you do burn the wires out you can call us and get a new sample probe in the system. So people do order that and they'll say, give us the system serial number and we'll give you a, uh, a new probe insert. It has the thermometers in it. We'll give you the calibration file and then you can put that in. We made the PPMS probe and the Dynacool probe the same length. So there's the same, uh, same overall length so that if you have different systems, you can transverse exchange samples in between the two types of probes. Another picture of the sample puck. One of the sample pucks has a, a printed circuit board on it with some numbering. You can put three samples on it because of the 12 wires, so you can do uh, three, four wire measurements. Uh, there's actually um, uh, another puck that lets you put your own wiring on that, so you can make your own connections to any of the pinouts. But they're twisted pairs, so one and two are twisted pairs. Uh, three and four twisted pairs up to, up to 12. We have a couple of different versions of the 
sample pucks, uh, the uh, things that are going around, there's a couple of probe pucks that fit into the rotator board. So uh, once again, you can put uh, three samples on them, plane parallel, plane perpendicular. So you can put the sample out of plane and those plug in. Uh, we have a helium-3 uh, insert and a Dilfridge insert. Those also have their own special types of puck. So depending on what experiment you're doing, you can use the particular type of puck on the sample. Uh, how do we prepare the sample? You typically want a uh, plate geometry to put the sample. Uh, it's typically what you have. Uh, you can measure your, the uh, dimensions of the sample, the length and the area and the thickness. Uh, you typically want to have, you want to have a homogeneous sample if you can, don't have it cracked or any voids in the, in the sample. And you need to make an ohmic contact to the sample. So you want to have good contact between your leads to the sample. So you don't want to have a uh, non-ohmic high resistance contact because then you're going to put an insulating layer on it and you, you're not going to have uh, good, good connections. Uh, you know, cleaned your sample. Uh, you can use uh, um, a number of techniques to, to make your contacts. So attaching the leads, right? So you can use uh, solder to attach the sample. The solder has many formulations. We'll do, we do a little experiment in the VSM to show, the, show you the magnetism of the solder. Um, the solder may not stick, though. Uh, uh, indium soldering, so you can use the uh, uh, ultrasonic soldering with the indium to break down the, the oxide layer that's on the solder. Wire bonding, so if you have access to a wire bonder, you can put a uh, wire bond connection. That's probably what a lot of people do to put the fine wires uh, to make your sample connections. Uh, silver paint, uh, easy way to go. Uh, you have to worry about the outgassing, so you have to make sure your uh, paint is dry. So you typically, you know, bake that to make sure the the, uh, the uh, solvents out of the paint. Uh, Two-part epoxy. Once on, once again, you need to bake these things out. You have better adhesion with the epoxy. They may work better above 100 uh, 100 C or kind of press press contacts. Uh, there's a professor down in New Zealand, uh, Dr. Wimbush. You can go to his website, and he makes some of these pogo pin <coughs> connectors. So he took some of our designs of the puck, and then he made some pin outs, so you can have pressed pins to make the electrical contacts from your sample to, the, to that. So uh, you could also buy little pogo pins. There's the little commercial things that you can buy that press onto the sample. So you can take your sample, have these pogo pins that put a pressure on the sample. You may not have good contact, right? So it may not be a perfect contact. These things t are mechanical in nature, so they tend to degrade. But you have, if you have a set of common samples where this works, it may be easier for you than doing a wire bonding or, or soldering contacts on your sample. So if it's something routine and you can get away with this type of pogo pin, maybe you can make more sample measurements, but there's a number of different pinout configurations, so you can do things like a Hall, Hall four-wire measurement or a, a Vanderpaw type measurement on, the, uh, on your sample. So there's a few ways you can do it, right? Silver paste to, uh, to type of pinouts. And if you look closely at the, uh, at the pucks, you've got the uh, printed circuit board where you can make your electrical contacts, and then you've got the, uh, the backing plate. So you need to insulate your sample from the, from the puck itself. So you can take a Kapton tape, cigarette paper with a little varnish on it, uh, an insulating substrate, right? So you don't want to have your sample shorted to the puck itself. Uh, we'll talk about the ground path in a future slide about making ESD sensitive type measurements. So there's a ground path to that. So you want to, uh, I'll, I'll have a special slide about making low noise measurements and ESD sample measurements. And essentially you're not going to use the puck for those types of samples. 
and you could solder things to the puck itself. How do you place the leads on the sample? Well, that's the type of measurement you're going to do, four wire measurement. You've got the contacts on the pad, uh, Vanderpaw measurement, so you can put your, your connections on the perimeter of the sample, and then you're going to take multiple measurements uh, on those contact points, and you can get resistivity uh, directly on that. We've got a nice application note that talks about the Vanderpaw method, uh, two wire method. So uh, high, high resistant type samples. So here's a couple of different configurations. So these are just the blue uh, rectangle just shows a sample that's mounted on the, on the configuration. You can see how we have it wired in the one, the one set up here for the Vanderpaw on the, on the right. <coughs> Simple two channel uh, hall type measurements on the left. What we provide is we give you a little breakout box on the, uh, with the instruments. And there's a little overlay that fits on the breakout box. So depending upon what type of experiment you want to measure, uh, we give you the pinouts. So if you choose the uh, heat capacity system, you can mount your sample and you can put the heat capacity overlay and then make your electrical connections on the bench. So mount your system, your sample on the puck put it in the, the measurement jig, and then you can use an ohm meter, multimeter, Keithley meter to make your electrical contacts at room temperature, do you have good contacts, and then you can move it into the sample. So we give you a little kits depending upon, upon the experiment. And if you have the rotator board, it, uh, it has a little adapter so it fits in the, in the uh, sample holder. So there's a couple of little things you can do to make sure the contact resistance is too high. So you've got your measured resistance, which is the sum of the lead resistance, the contact resistance, the multimeter resistance, and the sample resistance. So you know the lead resistance, you can estimate the resistance of the multimeter, and uh, you can then compute the uh, sample resistance. So try it in two different directions, is there any change in the resistance uh, with, the, with the current change, the excitation current change. And if there is, uh, there may be some uh, non-ohmic characteristic of your uh, contact resistance. So how do you reduce the contact resistance? Touch it up with some silver paste and let that dry. Sometimes if you have an oxide barrier, you can remove it by putting a little spark across the sample. You just have to know your trick to it. Sometimes you don't want to do that because it'll destroy the sample. But there's ways you have to just think about your, res your connections to your sample to the instrument. So there's lots of little tricks and tips to that one. So which transport method, method do I use? So the resistivity method. That's built into all the instruments, so the basic resistivity is set into each of the platforms, the Dynacool and the PPMS, classic PPMS system. So whatever you have, you can, you can run those uh, measurements. AC transport, that's an option that you would buy uh, to make measurements. That's the one that we made a lot of the critical current measurements of the uh, high temperature superconductors on over the years. So people are very familiar with that technique, that classic technique on the instruments. And then the latest technique that we added, it's not that new, but the ETO option. So that's since su supplanted the AC transport method, and you can do a couple of different uh, type measurements on these things. Uh, so resistivity two wire type measurement, IV curve, it's essentially a voltmeter, AC transport, critical current measurements, resistivity hall effect, ETO, resistivity hall effect, and we've got a couple of other type of measurements that you can add on to the ETO that we'll talk about. Uh, resistivity, it's measuring less than a uh, you know, point per second. Uh, the AC transport has a DSP technique in it, so similar to what you heard about the lock-in type techniques, it's a modulated signal. So it takes a little bit over a second to take each data point. And then the ETO is a faster measurement, so faster 
processing technology and a couple of different independent source and voltmeter, similar to what you would do for a low, uh, a nano, nano voltmeter type experiment. Here's a little summary of what I just said. So the ETO is a AC lock-in technique, two wire resistance, uh, it should be one mega ohm to five giga ohm uh, resistance range. ACT, it's a lock-in based technique, uh, only on the PPMS versions, low resistance sample, critical current type measurements. And the resistivity is a DC bridge. Uh, and then we talk about the number of channels and the maximum current. So the ACT option, the AC transport, you can put the uh, uh, two amp output uh, through that AC. Uh, resistivity, five milliamps, and ETO, 100 milliamp uh, current through your sample. Uh, the resistivity option that we built in uses the, uh, the bridge that we developed to read the thermometers on all the systems. So we have thermometry at the, uh, in the sample chamber in proximity to the sample. Uh, it's it's uh, part of the model 6000 controller that's in the system, the PPMS that's in the lab. So we use this uh, uh, system in that. So on the PPMS in the lab, it's in the model 6000 controller. In the Dynacool system, it's in the control module. So it's a little subtlety in the electronics where the, ele where the electronics location is. Uh, we're doing the uh, resistance measurement with the resistivity option. Uh, scan ex excitation mode measures the voltage at each DC current, I like an IV curve. And then you can also do it, use the system in a voltage mode. So it's just a voltmeter. So you can have a voltmeter across your sample to see if there's any uh, induced voltages due to temperature or magnetic field changes. So it's another mode that you can run that off of. Uh, so the current's turned off in the system and, it's, and uh, it's reporting the voltage that's generated across the sample. So there's an application that note that talks about how you can use the system as just a sensitive voltmeter. So that's built into all those systems. Here's a block diagram of, uh, of the uh, resistivity option. So we use a little multiplexer inside that, and uh, the leads are open circuit when they're not being measured. Uh, there's standard resistors that are inside the system so that we know the exact resistance, so we can refer, we know the value of that resistance, so we can know the current uh, source value. And uh, there's a couple of heaters in there, so this whole circuitry drives the heaters as well. So we've got a one amp or uh, 20 watt uh, circuit to put the heaters on to heat the sample space up. Five nanoamp to five milliamp excitation. Four readings a second. Bottom slide, bottom portion of the slides, the one to talk about is the uh, uh, one milliohm to one mega ohm is the good sweet spot for that measurement. Uh, ACT measurements, critical current measurements. So it's pretty much that, that's the uh, key measurement, IV curves, Hall coefficient, and resistivity type measurements. So those are the four things you can get out of the ACT measurements. 10 milliamp to two amp uh, AC value. Plus or minus five volts. Uh, optimized for low resistance samples. So this technique's good for low resistance uh, samples in the measurement, less than 100 ohms. On the Dynacool systems and systems with the CAN bus, we've got this ETO option. So technology changed, the communication buses have changed. So instead of us designing that uh, circuit that I showed you on the resistivity board, that's in the system. So we said, let's change the communication bus so we can have these modules that you would plug into the system so you can choose a different experiment module and the communication bus is faster. So we built these little boxes that you, that you can 
put a DSP inside there, put the amplification stages in there, and uh, some uh, connections to the outside world so you can monitor those signals. And you can slide these, uh, these into the rack in the control module. So they're called what we call the CAN modules that fit into the system. So it's, uh, the ETO <coughs> module has a little bit of a, a, it has a remote head, so that plugs in through some LIMO cables to the system. So you plug the, the main module into the CAN, and then you have some connections that go into the preamp that's external to the, to the main ETO module. So we use a digital locking inside this, so we've got a modulated uh, uh, measurement technique, a lock-in technique with the DSP. Uh, it's identical to the AC transport, so you've got those features on it. You can select the waveform that you want for the uh, uh, measure, or the frequency for the measurement. So you've got a triangle waveform and you can select that frequency. Uh, we've got this differential resistance mode that you can uh, make a measurement. So you can have uh, uh, an AC current on top of a DC uh, bias current. So you can bias your sample with one current and then have an AC modulation on top of it. So you can run it in a low uh, impedance mode, same as the ACT in resistivity mode, and then you can run it in a high impedance uh, measurement where you're using a two-wire type measurement. So here's a couple of uh, differences. The low impedance uh, technique, 10 nanoamps to 100 milliamps, one nanovolt to five volt. So the four-wire technique, resistance hall effect, IV and differential uh, measurements, and then the high impedance measurement. So essentially the high impedance measurement, sort of like the Keithley nano voltmeter, nano current meter setup that you might be used to in some of the measurements. Uh, frequency range for the ETO, uh, tenth of a hertz to 200 hertz. Uh, what's the key thing here? Uh, maximum resistance on the four wire, 10 mega ohm, and then five giga ohm on the two wire type measurement. Uh, selecting the frequency. So obviously you want to select frequencies for the measurement that are away from uh, 60 hertz, 50 hertz type measurements. So we recommend using uh, greater than 1800 hertz when you have a gain setting of uh, 300 or higher, uh, less than a hertz for high resistance samples, uh, and the system's designed to measure you know, DC resistive properties. So it isn't a uh, um, LCR bridge or uh, 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 LCR meter uh, impedance analyzer. So you're measuring DC resistances with, the, with these things. We've got a couple of application notes that talk about uh, uh, common mode leak through. So you may have a situation where you might have this uh, artifact in your measurement that uh, reports a negative resistance of the sample. So this application note describes this in detail. So essentially there's a couple of sources of this where you put your connections to on the sample. You might have a uh, relative current, the way you, you uh, wire bond or make your electrical connections to your sample. Uh, so you want to have your, your leads on your sample so that they're symmetric on the sample. So you wouldn't want to put leads close together on one part and farther apart on, on the other part of the sample. And then contact resistance is gonna, going to uh, give, you, give you these false readings on the on the sample. So it goes back to how do you mount your sample, right? So everything's pointing back to sample prep, putting leads on your sample, mounting it on, the, on that. So we give you the tools to make these types of measurements. So the non-ohmic contacts are, uh, are, are important. So the non-ohmic contact, the resistance is dependent upon the drive current, scan ex excitation, or you see this negative resistance value. Uh, we wrote a, an app note about the uh, 
feed-throughs. So the feed-throughs, the vacuum feed-throughs have uh, Inconel in them, and they have a uh, frequency response with, as a function of the uh, uh, resistance change as a function of frequency. So there's an AC response to the resistance of the uh, Inconel feed-throughs as a function of the, of the system. So you can see this effect. Uh, you can't get away with it because you need to use these feed-throughs in the uh, low temperature physics, right? So you need to have these feed-throughs to keep things at low temperature. So you buy these things, you have the wires going through them. But they may introduce artifacts into your measurements. So they're at low frequency, uh, excuse me, they're in the 25 to 35K region. So if you see an artifact in that region, it may not be due to your data. It may be due to the feed-throughs. And we've got an application note that describes the physics behind what's happening on that. And then there's some software updates that look for this, look for that. So we're, we're, so in the data file itself, we report a lot of parameters in the system. So when we do the lab this afternoon, you'll see the data file from the VSM measurement. The ETO, the resistivity, all the other measurements have an extensive table of data. So you can see all the parameters of the entire system when you make a measurement. So we'll talk in the tutorial about what we can look for uh, in these measurements, but it tells you the type of measurement, the drive current, the voltages. So you can see all these parameters in the ETO uh, data file. So there's a lot of things you can do with the base system, but if you have a ESD sensitive sample, yes. Is that the uh, the you want to use the base resistivity, and you have to switch around that because of the technique, because of the way that electronics module works on the system. So the Vanderpaul, you have to make physical connection changes on that, and the ETO doesn't let you do that easily. Oh, right, there's no multiplexer in the system that does that. Uh, ESD sensitive samples. So here's the case where all the everything that I've talked to you about the pucks goes out the window. You need to make your own probe and uh, run your own wires down to the probe if you have those, those samples. Uh, and it's due to the way that the ground in the system is. So you have to, you have to uh, take care of this case. So when we have customers that have ESD sensitive samples, we recommend that they design their own type of probe for that. So we have, uh, we have some solutions for that and we have some solutions coming up for that. But uh, we essentially use what we call a multifunction probe. So we give you a, we, you can purchase a bare probe that you can wire up through the top of the sample space. So it still can plug into the bottom of the physical property measurement system connection, or you can eliminate that entirely. So you can still use part of those wires to your sample, but you can run your own wires to your sample for these uh, ESD graphene type samples. So we wrote an application note that describes how you can use uh, your own probe or our MFP probe to, to make these measurements. So we have a lot of people doing these custom experiments for uh, dielectric constant measurements, uh, higher temperature measurements of uh, Hall effect, Seebeck effect to 1000K, uh, FMR, ferromagnetic resonance, so they'll put high frequency coax, supply and return coax, and have a little antenna at their sample so they can uh, irradiate microwaves onto their sample and look at the microwave response of their sample. They'll run fiber optics down and they'll still use the connections to the sample but shine light on the sample or uh, uh, put multiple twisted pairs. So a lot of the people in the graphene world want to have um, more than four wires which we don't supply so they'll build their own probes. So you'll see in the labs here that people wire their own probes and there's a lot of probes hanging on the wall. So we're trying to come up with some solutions here to to let you uh, 
to give you these twisted pairs. So we know, we know that's a gap in the instrument and we need to add that to our product line. And then there's a little breakout box that lets you break things out. So there's one in the lab that's a home built one here at the Mag Lab, but we also supply a little breakout box that fits into the LIMO connector on the system so you can have access to the uh, experiment wires. So we want to have the same wiring up to the, to the uh, MFP probe. Question? Correct. That's exactly right. So it goes back to this, you know, breakdown limit of our wiring, and uh, if you want to gate the sample, you've got to use one of those probes. So we're trying to come up with a solution for those type of samples. And we're not too far off from that. Uh, there was a question asked yesterday, how do I interface my program to MultiView? So MultiView is the pl software platform that gives you this pile of data. So you can use, we have a little DLL that you can obtain from us, and you can use that in your program to link systems together. And there was a question, do I have access to the field value in a Dynacool? And you, do, you don't have a physical connection to that value. On the old versions of the systems, you have a physical value where you can see the output of the field on the old PBMS. But on the Dynacool, it's all digital. So you can get that digital data, take it through the DLL, and then communicate. If you have two separate computers, you can run the, through the LAN. I forgot who asked me that yesterday. Right, you asked me that. Gate voltage. All right, we know who, it, who to help out. Great. So you can do that through, the, uh, through that protocol. So you can do it through the LAN. So if you have your own computer that's running yours, uh, data collection routines, you can use this DLL and talk through the LAN to synchronize the collection of your data to what we report out of the magnetic field. All right, we'll uh, show you some of the other, other experiments. So uh, uh, thermal transport. So the one on the far right is the uh, pickup co the coils for the VSM. And you'll see that in the lab today. Thermal transport option, heat capacity options. And now let's change gears and we'll talk a little bit about tips for making some of the magnetometry uh, measurements on the systems. So typically you're doing the VSM uh, measurements on the PPMS Dynacool series. The squid magnetometer has a VSM mode to it, but it's using the squid to make the VSM measurements. So Typically, the squid measurement for the magnetometry for those hysteresis curves is a DC squid type method. So the, with the squid, you have uh, 10 to the minus 8 EMU sensitivity. The VSM technique is 10 to the minus 6 EMU. So you've got better sensitivity with the squid magnetometer. So our engineers came up with an idea, hey, if we use the VSM head with the squid, we can come up with a squid VSM. So we had this. SVSM, the squid VSM system that we came out with. We had the DC squid, MPMS XL. We came out with a squid VSM, and we've moved it back to, an, to a uh, DC squid system. So we still, so we came out, we branched off the squid measurement technique into this squid VSM measurement. And there's a couple of these systems here in the, the magnet lab, but they're still, they still do a DC squid measurement. I'm pointing this out to you because there's an alternate path to make some of the VSM measurements. And uh, it's used in the, v in the MPMS series instruments. But it's not, a, it's not a, the VSM measurement that we're gonna talk about to. So we have a full paper that describes this new measurement technique for squid magnetometry. So essentially we, we confused the marketplace by coming out with this system. So it was, it was, uh, it's a point of confusion for our customers, but it's, uh, it's not a VSM method. So we confused everybody is what I'm saying on the, the squid system, but it does DC squid measurements for magnetometry as the squid system. I'm not going to talk about that instrument from here on, but the sample mounting techniques apply to the squid, on the VSM apply to the squid system as well. So I've even confused you. 
So the VSM over other types of magnetometry. So fast measurement, the sample's moving fast through the, through the uh, magnetic field. You're taking measurements while you're sweeping the sample through the field. 10 to the minus 6 e EMU in a less than a uh, second measurement time. So it's a sensitive measurement. You're moving it through a small amplitude, so it's only moving a couple of millimeters uh, through the magnetic field. It's in a homogeneous part of the field, so the field uh, distribution is uh, variations eliminated because it's in the homogeneous part of the field. So on the, on the PPMS system, we have a nice plateau where the field's flat. So it's about, uh, I think about, uh, six centimeters where you've got a nice good uniformity in the field and we're using a small portion of that. Uh, it's, VSM's a lock-in technique, so we take the motion as a reference signal and we can demodulate it, that reference signal. You can drive the motor from 10 to, 10 to uh, uh, 80 hertz. It's about 10 millimeter plateau on the, uh, on the homogene homogeneous region. Of the, of the magnet. Uh, VSM sample holders, you'll see this in the lab. We've got a quartz paddle. Mount your sample to the quartz paddle. Paddle with uh, some varnish, uh, cement, uh, some tape, Kapton type tape. Uh, we've got a little brass holder with a couple of uh, uh, capsules that uh, hold the sample in place. Uh, there's also a little powder holder where you can put powder inside and uh, hold the powder inside the, uh, the part of this vessel and uh, clamp it together. So the brass tube sort of holds it mechanically in place. Uh, and then we've got a little larger version of the same brass tube that fits into the large coil set. So we've got a small and a large six millimeter and a 12 mil millimeter diameter coil set, so the pickup coil diameter. Uh, we've got a little mounting jig, so once you put the sample, uh, once you, d you can find out, so on, the f on these two holders, you know where the sample location is in the center. So especially on the quartz paddle, so you can figure out where your center is. We have a little alignment jig that lets you place the, we use the tape measure, we know where the field center is. You can mount the sample in the center, and uh, that way you know you put it in the instrument, it's in the proper location. So we give you a little alignment jig. You'll see this in the lab. Uh, this is the brass holder where you can put a powder inside of it. Be careful when you use powders in these systems because if the powder escapes the holder, uh, the person after you is not going to be happy because the uh, powder will be on the inside of the instruments and somebody will chase you down. Uh, <laughs> but people can run powders in them, so you just have to be careful on them. Uh, drinking straws, so people use straws to put their sample in. So they'll have, uh, the nice thing about the straws, you can put a sample inside the straw and mount the uh, sample horizontally or vertically in the sample. Uh, and the, the uh, other factor is liquid, liquid samples. We don't have an official holder for liquids, but people have, uh, have uh, run liquids in the system. They'll build their own cell with maybe an NMR capillary, and you have to make sure there's no bubbles in the, in the uh, liquid when you're making the measurement. So those options go up to 400K. The system does go up to 400K in temperature. Uh, the other thing you can use is the VSM oven. So you can mount your sample on the oven heater stick. Uh, it's wrapped in copper foil and you can go to 1000K. So the system's in high vacuum mode, so the coil set stays at low temperature. So we're just locally heating it with a, a zirconia heater stick, so your sample's on a zirconia heater stick and that has a uh, low magnetic moment. So here's some tips and we'll almost wrap up here in a, in a minute or two. Uh, tips for VSM measurements, don't disturb the detection coil. 
uh, and I'll go through details on these things, make the sample holder invisible, uh, mount the sample securely, correct for sample geometry, uh, make sure your magnetic field's correct, and make sure your sample's in the right position. So don't disturb the, the uh, pickup coils. So the coils fit in the bottom of the instrument. If you have a situation where the coils are moving, that's gonna add an artifact to your measurement. So you need to make sure the rods and sample rod isn't touching the, the coil. So if you try to put something too large into the system and if it hits the coil as the sample's moving, it'll bump the coil and give you an artifact. The common source of this error is there's some ice that forms in the system. So you didn't purge the system out enough. So ice will form on a couple of the parts on the sample rod and those will touch the coil and, and uh, cause, a, cause an artifact. So you need to make sure your sample's not outgassing or, uh, uh, excuse me, it's not absorbing atmosphere and then freezing, freezing into the system. So those are some things that uh, you may wanna just check and check the high vacuum of the system so that there's no ice forming. There's a subtlety if the 40 hertz frequency isn't correct, if there's some resonance, that might be an issue and we've got an app note in the service bulletins that talk about that particular case. Make the sample holder invisible. Use non-magnetic tools when you hold your sample because of those things may add uh, uh, contamination to your sample, right? So there's some well-known papers where people made measurements and they thought they had a discovery but it was from the tools that they used and introduced into some of the, the uh, nanomaterials that they were developed. Uh, keep your sample holder uniform. So you want to have the, the sample holder itself as long. You say, well, why don't you just make the sample holder small and put it in there? Because you want the sample holder to be constant as it gets going through the coil set. So the sample holder isn't inducing anything into the coil set. So your sample holder material should be uh, non-magnetic. So if you have a new set of straws, so somebody will change straws or something like that, run the blank straws, run your blank holder. Do I have an artifact of my sample holder? Is that causing some artifact into my VSM measurement? Thin films, run your substrate of your thin film because that will tell you if the substrate has a, a high magnetic field, a high magnetic moment or a diamagnetism that may influence your measurement. So try to run your blank holder as a sanity check to your, to your holder plus sample. That's always a good thing. So make it invisible. Uh, make sure the sample's mounted correctly. So is it mechanically mounted correctly? Do you use the right adhesive? Does the adhesive have a magnetic signature? So make sure you run your adhesive if you're using that or your Kapton tapes. Sample geometry. So the measurement assumes some sam sample geometries. You can correct for those factors. We've got a nice table in the user manual that will talk about uh, shape factors for the sample material. Uh, remnant field. So superconducting magnets have a remnant field. There's a couple of tricks that you can do to <coughs> minimize the remnant field. It's about 20 gauss in the nine Tesla system and 100 gauss in the 14 Tesla system. So essentially, if you're making measurements at low magnetic fields, you have to worry about the remnant field because that may dominate your experiment. And we have a nice app note on that. And then uh, sample location, right? So you use the alignment jig uh, to make sure your sample's in the correct location. We have a feature called the touchdown uh, in the system where we touch the bottom of the sample space and that we know the length of the rod so we know where to put, pull the rod back up to to place it in the middle of the sample. But if you put your sample at some offset, then it's offset in the pickup coils of the system. And then a common thing is that our service guys will go in and we find that somebody dropped the sample. Oh, the VSM doesn't work. So some people make a measurement, the sample falls off into the bottom, it does the touchdown and then things are are off uh, spatially because it's hitting the last guy's sample. So I was asking the service manager, 
you know, what's the common thing? He said, this is very common because people drop things in there and then they leave and they don't tell the next person and then people are scratching their heads while the instrument doesn't work. So occasionally check your, if you drop something in, tell somebody. Just don't leave it in the sample. People are typically, if you tell somebody, people are pretty nice. Otherwise, you have to, you know, you're going to have to go fishing, but it's better to do that than have uh, bad data. And there's a couple of apps application notes on, on these things. <coughs> All right, so do you see, what do you see in the data? Is there steps or gaps? It could be due to the uh, uh, touchdown issues, uh, an old samples in there. It may be due to voltage gain ranging of the, uh, of the, the preamp in the system. If you see some gaps, so those are things to think about. Are you at a point where the gain range is changing, so it's giving you this offset? Uh, does the hysteresis loop uh, not close? So the sample moved, typically. Uh, is there a peak in your sample, in your data, in the 40 to 50K range? Uh, the sample may have absorbed oxygen, so it's showing some uh, response from the oxygen peak. Air leaked into the system and uh, is giving you this false peak. Uh, at 40, 50K, it's a real peak, but it's due to oxygen. So if you see features in that region, it could be oxygen in your sample. Noisy data, samples loose, the coils are vibrating. And if it's a large moment, then there's probably something wrong with the detection wiring. So look at how the connections are made on the system. And in those cases, you're typically going to call us. So. If you have questions about an application issue or support issue, you can go to send an email to QD Apps or service at uh, QD USA. We've got a technical contact on the website. And if you contact us, make sure you tell us your name. So it's surprising how many people don't tell us their name or give us their phone number. So we want to call you back. We do want to call you back. We're not trying to avoid you. It's our interest to help you as much as we can and we want to help you. That's why we're in this business. And we'll typically talk to you at any time. So we're just like you. We work crazy hours and we're, uh, we're typically on our phones, right? So, but give us a call back number. I have a complicated name. So I grew up spelling my name about a hundred times to everybody. So make sure you spell your name right so we know your name. Or at least when you talk to us, give us your first name. So these are some just tips when you call a service or apps group, just, just tell us that basic information because we want to call you back. On these instruments, it's always good to give us information on what you're doing. If you can give us the log file, it's great. Uh, give us the serial number. We've got TeamViewer. The guys like to TeamViewer into your system. <coughs> so we put that on every system and we'll come in and look at it. So we've got guys in the service team that can just log in and they might be able to solve your problem in a couple of minutes, if we have your name and number to call you back, uh, the simplest explanation is probably the correct one. So that's probably a good way to do it if you're trying to troubleshoot things. We have an educational website that we put together. So if you don't know how to do some experiments, we had a person do a professor do a post or a sabbatical with us, and they wrote about 10 tutorials on magnetism, thermal measurements. Uh, uh, heat capacity measurements uh, with videos and uh, lecture notes. So if you can, uh, if you you can look at this website and uh, use it as a tutorial. We also wrote some uh, class notes for this. So if you have to teach a class on Hall effect or transport measurements, you can take these notes and use them in your class. Uh, we've got some YouTube videos on YouTube. Uh, spare parts. If you need spare parts, you don't necessarily have to call one of our guys in uh, service or sales. You can go into the website and under the supports tab, we have all the consumables to us. We have Pharos Digital Library, almost done, 30 seconds. This is a digital library that has all the app notes. If you go to this, sign up for it. There's uh, Tutorials, texts on there, application notes, service notes, software updates. So it's worthwhile to look at that. 
What's new at QD? We've developed a dilatometer, so you can do the, uh, the Haas Van Alphen effect with the ex thermal expansion, so a new probe that we put in the system to do these things. Some nice papers on this, on a couple of compounds. We have an AC susceptometer for the DILF ridge, so you can do AC susceptibility at 50 millikelvin, not as low as you can do here, but you can add these samples into it. And we added an ADR module to the system, so you can do transport at 100 millikelvin. So that was a lot of slides to go through. I know there's a lot of information. We can keep talking. Thanks for uh, uh, listening today. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to help you uh, answer them. Thank you.